Everybody, give it up for Mark. Hello, everyone. My name is Mark Opunt, and I am an iOS engineer at Lickability. And today, I'm going to be talking to you about Swift without screens powering connected devices. By the end of this talk, I'm going to show you how I took the very uh, the language that most of us know very well and love and used it to build my own project called the TriBot Model 3. The TriBot Model 3, simply put, is a battery-driven robot car with a, ras with a Raspberry Pi running Swift. That's right, you heard correctly. Swift running on something that isn't an iPhone, MacBook, watch, or Apple TV. Even Elon himself can't get enough of it, but enough about that. <laughs> In order for us to appreciate the project at hand, we first must understand how we got here. In 2014, at WWDC, Craig Federici dropped a bombshell announcement on stage. No, it wasn't how much money he could save by switching his car insurance to Geico, but instead, it was a new programming language. Objective C without the C is what it was referred to. That's right, I'm talking about Swift. As I watched the keynote, I was just as excited as this guy. And I asked myself, <laughs> what does it mean for me? Up to that point, I had some exposure to Objective C, but I knew I didn't want that in my life. <laughs> this seemed like a perfect opportunity to give mobile development a try. Little did I know, I would spend the next years through the proverbial waxing on and waxing off of software development. It started with a multitude of tutorials from the likes of Ray Wenderlich, Dev Slopes, and Hacking with Swift, just to name a few. See, the thing is, all of those resources had something different to offer. It was up to me to use the different sources and gather important bits that would help me in my journey. During that time, some things seemed like overkill or even possibly redundant. Why did I need to learn how to read documentation or understand certain APIs at a deeper level? See, this is no different than when Danielson went through the process of waxing Mr. Miyagi's car. In his mind, the work was pointless, but Mr. Miyagi was teaching him an important lesson that would soon manifest itself. I would soon see the manifestation for myself as I explored the possibilities of Swift outside of mobile development. Shortly after Swift was announced, it became open source. This created, pathway, uh, created a pathway for things like Swift on Linux to become a thing. Because Swift could now run on Linux, we could put it on a Raspberry Pi. But first, what's a Raspberry Pi? A Raspberry Pi is a low-cost credit, so credit card-sized computer that plugs into a monitor or TV and uses a standard keyboard and mouse. It's, it's, it is a capable little device that enables people of all ages to explore computing and learn how to program in languages like Scratch or Python. It's capable of doing everything you'd expect a desktop computer to do, from browsing the internet, playing high-definition video, making spreadsheets, and so much more. First Pi launched in 2012, and there was several iterations and variations released since then. The original Pi had a single core 700 megahertz CPU and just 256 megabytes of RAM. The latest model, Raspberry Pi 4, has a quad core 1.5 gigahertz CPU with up to four gigabytes of RAM. GPIO stands for the General Purpose Input Output. The latest Pis have 40 of them, and each pin has a specific purpose. Some of them function not only as input-output pins, but as serial pins as well. The pins can be used to control electronic components for physical computing as well as exploring the Internet of Things. Let's take a look at a few of the components you can use alongside the Raspberry Pi. First is the HC SRO4 ultrasonic sensor. It has four pins, a ground pin, a echo pin, trigger, and a five-volt supply. We power the module using VCC, ground it using ground, and use our Raspberry Pi to send an input to signal to the trigger, which triggers the sensor to send an ultrasonic pulse. The pulse waves bounce off of nearby objects, and some are reflected back to the sensor. The sensor detects these return waves and measures the time between the trigger and return pulse, and then it sends a five volt signal to the echo pin. The echo, will be low until the sensor is triggered 
when it receives that pulse. From there, we can use Swift code to measure the pulse duration and then calculate the distance. Another device is the uh, active buzzer or the piezo speaker, which is an electromagnetic sound emitter that converts electrical uh, signal into sound. An electromagnetic, uh, an electromagnetic with a magnetic membrane is placed on the housing with the passage of electric current through the magnet. During this process, the membrane begins to os oscillate, thereby creating a sound signal. You've probably heard this sound before in like alarm devices, computers, timers, as well as like uh, the confirmation of user input such as a mouse click or a keystroke. You also have the DC gearbox motor, uh, which is also known as the TT motor. This is a motor with a gear ratio of 1 to 48 and comes with two 200 millimeter wires that are perfect for plugging into the breadboard or terminal blocks. DC motors are probably one of the most common components used alongside the Raspberry Pi because of the multiple use cases for things like robotics or similar projects. However, DC motors cannot be driven by a Raspberry Pi alone and require an additional motor driver. For my project, I use the L298N motor controller. Let's take a closer look at how it works. The L298N is also known as a dual H-bridge rectifier module. The H-bridge in the name refers to the look of the schematic that drives it. In an H-bridge configuration, the rotation of the motors is dependent upon which of the switches is open or closed. When S1 and S4, based on this diagram here, are, are on, the left motor terminal is more positive than the right terminal, and the motor rotates in a certain direction. Vice versa, on the other hand, when S2 and S3 are on, the right motor terminal is positive and the left motor terminal making the motor rotate in another direction. While the L298N is commonly used with motors, it can also be used to drive relays and solenoids. The module can accept anywhere from five, volt, five volts to 35 voltage DC input with the recommended amount being somewhere between seven, seven and 12 volts. If you input less than seven volts, the internal five volt regulator will not function, and if you input over 12 volts, you, you run the risk of burning up the internal five volt regulator. To get around this, there is a jumper on the motor that you can disconnect to uh, supply your own five volt regulated voltage so that you can have more flexibility. Once you've provided your voltage, controlling the motors is just a matter of sending the proper signals to the input pins. In order to further illustrate this, let's take a look at the truth table for a L298N. This truth table represents the various values we can have with our motor. When the enable switch is off, which is ENA, regardless of the values of input one and input two, the motor's always off. Once ENA is on, which is the enable switch, uh, based on providing either a 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, or 1, 1, that provides various states for the motor. So you can either stop it, go backwards, forwards, or stop it again. Relatively simple. In order to make use of this hardware, however, we need the use of a library like Swifty GPIO. This library provides an easy way to interact with external sensors and devices using the digital GPIOs, SPI, interfaces, buses, PWM signals, and so much more. Like Android things or similar libraries in Python, Swifty GPIO provides the basic functionalities you need to control different devices, sensors, displays, uh, input devices, joy pads, uh, RGB LED strips, and so much. Now that we've covered all of that hardware, let's take a closer look at the software and in installing Swift on the Pi. Recently, I wrote a blog post covering this here at a very high level. There are two ways to install Swift. You can either build Swift yourself or use pre-compiled binaries. I would highly recommend option two because the first option will take several days to do on the Raspberry Pi. The pre-compiled binaries are possible because of the work of the Swift Arm Group. They have put together a repository that allows you to install Swift using the Advanced Package Tool, or APT for short. Let's take a look at the steps necessary. The very first step is essentially adding the uh, Swift ARM repo to your Pi via this curl script. 
Once you do that, it's just a matter of specifying the version of Swift that you want, and voila, you're done. Now let's take a look at a few projects that were built using the Raspberry Pi. One of the most popular ones is a, a project called the Magic Mirror. The Magic Mirror is essentially a smart mirror with a screen behind it. That screen can be an Android tablet or a computer monitor. Naturally, a monitor will make a, a, for a larger mirror, but it's also a great way to repurpose the use of an old LCD monitor that you may have laying around. But you can't cram a full computer in there unless you use a Raspberry Pi. Now, one of my own projects, of course, is the TriBot Model 3. Here's one of the parts lists that I used, well, the parts list that I used to actually build it out. Um, this particular kit came with everything displayed here. You get your gearbox motors, uh, a base to hold it, your wheels, and a battery holder, as well as using the L298 motor driver controllers. Here's a circuit of what it looks like when it's finally all put together. First, you have the motors connected to the motor input pins on both sides of the L298N controller. You have your 12-volt uh, DC voltage going in, as well as your various uh, cables going from the input pins of the motor controller to the GPIO pins on the Raspberry Pi. In this specific instance, I'm using GPIO 17, 22, 23, and 24. You could use whatever you like, but I, I chose to use those particular pins. Here are a few pictures of the actual uh, building of the Pi. As you can see here, it was kind of a mess at first, trying to figure out what my circuit would be like, putting things together. Because I used the Pi Zero, I had to do lots of soldering, which I had to re-pick up on that, because that was I hadn't done that in a while. So lots of fun soldering. Um, the motor, the unit finally put together here, as well as the kit that you get when you first uh, put all of this together. Now, I know we're all devs in here, so let's see the code. How does this thing work? So I could try to show you this, but this is way small, so we're going to zoom in. <laughs> the first step is to retrieve the list of GPIOs available on the board. In this particular case, I'm using the Raspberry Pi Zero. However, multiple board types are supported. Secondly, once we have the list of GPIOs, we can get a reference to the ones we want to modify. In our case, these are pins 17, 22, 23, and 24. The next step is to set the direction of our pins. In our case, they all need to be output pins as we are using them to output a 3.3 volt signal to our L298N, which will then trigger our motors to operate. Based on our truth table, in order to drive the motor forwards, we need a value of one and zero to our, we, we set a value of one and zero to our pins. Once this is complete, we sleep the thread for about two seconds. Now there's no real need to do this except for the sake of this demo. I did this to have the car perform a sequence on its own without having to intervene. Once the sleep delay is complete, we set the motors back to zero to stop it. Now, in order to go to the opposite direction, we just flip the values. Before it was 1 and 0, now it's just 0 and 1. This will drive the car backwards. After performing the same pause as before, we set the motors back to 0 to stop the car. To perform a right turn, we simply enable one of the motors while the other one is stopped. We stop as well, and then we perform another stop and proceed to flip the bits to have the car make a left turn. And that's it. It's literally that simple to write some Swift code that controls DC motors thanks to the heavy lifting of, the, uh, of Swifty GPIO. Now, all of this is fun and dandy, but in most cases, whenever you have to build to the pie, towards the Pi, you could actually write your code directly on the Pi, which is not fun, unless you're one of those nano Vim people that <laughs> love using nano and Vim. However, with that, you don't get autocomplete. And so that makes it much difficult, uh, much more difficult. So for me, I use the library called Swish. And what Swish allows you to do is, is a simple script for remote building your Swift projects on a Linux machine. Why is that so cool? Because you can develop an Xcode on Mac OS and can use external build system to deploy your code on Linux. Here's the process of doing that. First, you add a new target. 
you select cross-platform and select an external build system. From there, you name your build system. I'm just calling mine's remote build. In the argument section, you add the keyword swish, the username that's currently running on the Pi, and the IP address of the Pi, or the host name. Once that's set, you have to then add the, we want to be able to build, uh, uh, execute our target. So we add a scheme. Uh, I go down to the bottom where I have my remote build. I select my remote build target, and I add that. And from there, I can build. And once I hit Command B to build, all of my code that I wrote gets sent, sent over to the Raspberry Pi. And I, from there, I can just execute it on the Pi. Future improvements to enhance my project are, being that I did call it a Model 3, uh, I want to be able to eventually have object uh, avoidance detection. So in the workshop that I had uh, on Sunday, uh, the, everyone built a sensor that is able to detect, uh, using the HRSR, HCSR04, we built a circuit that determines distance. And based on that distance, I can then tie that into my car to allow it to avoid objects as it's driving around. Now, how do you get started, you may ask? Simple. The easiest way is to purchase kits like these. These kits are relatively inexp inexpensive, and they come with almost everything you need to get started, from LEDs to pin pads to uh, uh, a matrix, breadboards, and everything you could possibly uh, use. Why is the Pi important in this process? Well, as we all know, we love Swift, but for most folks, in order to get started with Swift, it requires a thousand plus dollar MacBook, thousand plus dollar iPhone, which makes it uh, very difficult for folks who don't necessarily have a pot of gold laying around. So with that being said, uh, the Pi is a relatively cheap and inexpensive device that you can purchase for less than 50 bucks and get a kit, and with that kit, comes everything you need to be able to write code. Um, in addition, not just any code, but Swift code. Now, some of us may ask, why Swift? Well, as Paige Bailey said yesterday, <laughs> Python is a trash language. <laughs> so to recap, we went over the Raspberry Pi and introduced the ability to take Swift that we would normally use on our iOS and macOS apps and actually use it on embedded devices. The possibilities are endless. It's just a matter of having a really good imagination and tinkering with things like I did. That being said, that's my talk.